Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on the topic of staying vertical, reduce your risks for falls. My name is Ann Lee Gilbert, and I'm the Programs Manager for Candy Multiple Sclerosis, and I'm happy to be your moderator this evening. For those of you who might not be familiar with who we are, CanDo MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people who are living with MS and their support partners. Through our programs, we empower people to manage their disease and their daily symptoms uh, to help move beyond their MS by adopting active and healthy lifestyle behaviors. And you can uh, learn about all of our programs that we provide by going to our website at www.mscando. Dot org backslash programs. We have our four-day jumpstart program. We have our one-day, uh, I'm sorry, our one-day jumpstart program that's available five to six times a year in different parts of the country. We have our flagship can-do program that's held once a year in Denver, and we have our two-and-a-half-day take charge program that's held twice a year. And of course, we have our webinar series that we hold monthly. So uh, please visit our website, and you can learn how to register for these programs and find out if uh, we'll be in your neighborhood. You can also connect with us on social media. Uh, find us on Facebook, like us, and you can learn about all types of up-to-date information regarding our upcoming programs and events. You can also connect with us on Twitter, and you can receive tweets about happenings at CanDo MS and, and find some fun tweets about all of our programs. And you can also find us on YouTube, and you can browse through all of our fun um, videos and learn about our staff members and also find some archived webinar recordings on YouTube. Before uh, we get started with, with tonight's webinar, there are a few housekeeping issues I'd like to go over. We will be saving the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar to answer your questions and answers, or to answer your questions. If you do have a question, you can post them in our chat feature, which you'll see is located on the left-hand bottom of your computer screen. So to submit a question, just type in a question in that small box and uh, send it to chat with presenters. And this way, we'll be able to hold your questions and address them at the end of the webinar. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, and it will be archived on our website. And because it is being recorded, all of, all of your telephone lines have been muted. And so now I'd like to introduce uh, the presenters for this evening's webinar. On your screen, you'll see our physical therapist, Kathy San Martino. Kathy has been a physical therapist since 1984, and she specializes in treating patients with neurological diagnoses, including MS. She has worked in, in acute care rehab, home care, and outpatient settings. Since 2000, she has worked at Casa Colina Rehab Center in Pomona, California, where she is an outpatient clinical coordinator. She works with a local neurologist in, the MS, in a weekly MS clinic. She runs the MS wellness programs for the local National MS Society. She also directs the wheelchair and seating clinic, and she has recently joined the MS, Can Do MS staff. Welcome, Kathy. And here you'll see Ann Molinix. Ann Molinix is an occupational therapist of 26 years living in Minneapolis. She has been a Can Do MS program consultant for 21 years. Ann just recently resigned from Methodist Hospital Park Nicolette after 25 years working in neurological rehabilitation to pursue graduate school at the University of Minnesota for a degree in integrative health and wellness coaching. Ann will continue to work with individuals with MS using a holistic perspective to improve health and well-being, helping people to achieve their goals. Welcome, Ann. And so now we're excited to um, have everyone on this webinar, and I'd like to now hand the controls over to Kathy. So. The topic today is staying vertical, how to reduce your risk for falls. And as you know, for people with MS, this is an important topic. According to the International Journal of MS Care, in a given year, nearly 60% of individuals will, with MS will experience a fall, and over 70% of older people with MS report moderate to extreme balance problems, thereby putting them at risk for falls. Now Anne's going to go over the list of MS symptoms that can contribute to falls. Thanks, Kathy. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening in tonight. As you can see from the slide, many symptoms can contribute to falls, such as fatigue, sensory loss, medication side effects, and even fear of falling. The intent of this information is not to provoke an overwhelming feeling for you, but to understand that many factors contribute to falls and they all have the potential to be influenced 
so falls decrease. And this is what we will be addressing tonight. So the other thing we'll be addressing is looking at challenges in the home and risk factors in the community that can contribute to falls, and then discussing how you can reduce the effects of some of those um, risk factors. So now Anne is going to start addressing some of the MS symptoms. Okay, so as Kathy said, we will, we will be looking at each of the symptoms that can play a part in falling and give suggestions of strategies or adaptations to improve function. The first area I want to talk about or symptom is fatigue because it is so commonly experienced by people with MS and it can be that overarching symptom or problem that gets in the way with a lot of daily living. So to review, what does it look like? For some, it is unpredictable and others predictable with a pattern of worsening as the day progresses. What is happening? A combination of theories exists, but what is clear is that an individual with MS experiences normal fatigue like anyone, as well as MS fatigue that occurs from the disease process of inflammation and demyelination. What does it do? It can affect everything, and you, the audience, do not need me to tell you this. But the takeaway is self-awareness. How does fatigue impact your daily life? Is it expressed more in physical weakness and imbalance or mind fogginess and distraction? Having this awareness will help you address how to better manage fatigue and understand this management can impact falls. So what can you do? How can you better manage fatigue to decrease falls? One way is to keep engaged with regular exercise and activity. This is an important component in better fatigue management, improving endurance, strength, flexibility, and balance. A tremendous impact on preventing falls. Kathy will be speaking more of this later, but one note, know your limits. A good thing taken too far can be detrimental. Falls often occur when we are tired. Take control of your energy and manage your time by having the awareness of when your energy is at its best. This is when you should perform the highest demand activities. It is important to know limits and stop before you're fatigued. Simplify your daily tasks. What can be delegated? What can be eliminated? And get creative. Can you perform a regular activity in a more convenient place in your home? Or can you sit to perform more activities? Another thing to think about is adapting. In your home environment, get rid of the clutter. We all have it. Clear it. Reorganize your space so the items you use most often are in the easiest to obtain places. Okay, Kathy. So now we're going to talk about muscle spasticity and how it can affect your risk of falls. So there are pros and cons to having muscle spasticity. The cons are that spasticity can create a stiffness in the limb, making it difficult to advance the limb, to bend it and bring it forward, which can cause you to expend more energy and get more fatigued. So some of the common areas of muscle spasticity in individuals with MS are spastic calf muscles and spastic quad muscles. So when you have a spastic calf muscle, that tends to make you drag your toes as you're trying to advance your leg, and that puts you at risk for tripping. When you have a spastic quad muscle, the front of your thigh, it can make it difficult to bend that knee when you're advancing. Um, and like I said, expend more energy and also not um, clearing the ground as well. Some of the pros for some people is muscle spasticity can give you um, kind of a stiffness that can be used as strength when you're standing on the leg so it's less apt to buckle underneath you. Now, muscle weakness can cause a couple of problems. It can cause the leg to buckle when you are standing on that leg and, as in walking. Um, it can also make it difficult to actually lift the leg to advance it, causing trips and, again, expending more energy. So the key to not falling is, one, create, developing balance so you just don't fall. But then the other concern is if you do start to falter, do you have the strength and the quickness in your muscles to catch yourself when you do falter? 
Then there's also ataxia. So sometimes people will have good strength in their muscles, but the, they lack coordination in using that muscle appropriately. So it's important to have the right amount of strength to kick in the muscle at the right time, the right amount. And when that, that is not happening, there's a lack of coordination in moving that limb or your trunk. And again, you're expending more energy to move, and it can adversely affect your balance. So what can we do about these things? So some of the ways we address muscle spasticity, weakness, and ataxia is first of all with an exercise program. So what I try to encourage my patients with MS to do is to come in and see me once a year or so or some routine basis. Just like you see your neurologist on a routine basis, it can be helpful seeing a physical therapist no matter what your level of impairment is to kind of tweak your exercise program, make sure you're on the right track. Um, also, the other way we address muscle spasticity and weakness is with orthotics, um, and I'll explain that in a minute, and then also with assistive devices. The other thing I should have added this, to this list is sometimes the physician can um, prescribe medication that may also help with muscle spasticity and weakness. So different bracing options, different orthotic options. Um, on the left of your screen, uh, you'll see this device, it's a belt around the woman's waist, and then there's bungee cords, basically, that run down the length of her leg, and they're attached to her shoe. And that's called a hip flexion assist device. You can Google that term, hip flexion assist device. And this was created for individuals with MS. And basically what it does is it spring loads your leg, so it can help you lift your leg um, when you're walking. The other two options are braces that we often use on the ankle so you're not dragging your toes. So sometimes what we see with clients with MS is that they may have some weakness in their ankle or spasticity that we need to control with these ankle foot orthoses. But then if the rest of their leg is weak or spastic, they're still not picking their leg up well enough. And that's when we may also suggest the hip flexion assist device. So sometimes people are, don't like the idea of wearing bracing because they're concerned their ankle's going to get weaker. And what I suggest is, well, then that's when we add exercises to your exercise program to keep that muscle strong. But if we can control your ankle, and if that quiets some of your spasticity in your ankle, sometimes it can quiet some of the spasticity in the rest of your leg. And if we can help you with the weakness in your ankle, Sometimes it will give the muscles in the rest of your leg a little more chance to work better. There are some higher tech alternatives to bracing as well. The advantage of these higher tech alternatives is, is that they use electrical stimulation, so they could possibly help you re-educate those muscles. The downside is they cost a pretty penny. So some insurances, many insurances won't pay for these. Some private do. Um, so on the left-hand side of your screen is the Bioness, which is that cuff there has electrodes underneath it that um, will stimulate the muscles that pull your toes up when you're advancing your limb. That device costs $6,000. Right next to it is the Bioness Plus, which is the addition of a cuff piece in your thigh that can be used to stimulate the front of your back of your thigh, depending on what needs to be accomplished. And that costs, I think, about $10,000. Um, and then on the far right is the WalkAid, which is a different manufacturer. And again, that's a cuff around your, your calf, and it has electrodes underneath it that pull your toes up when you go to advance your leg. And that goes for $4,700. Then there are assistive devices. If you can unload your legs so they're not having to work as hard, that can quiet some of your spasticity. And then also it can com accommodate some of your weakness so that your legs aren't doing all the work. So on the left-hand side of your screen are forearm crutches. And then we have the four-wheeled walker on the bottom there. And the advantage of that is you have a handy seat if you're on um, the community and you get fatigued. And then, of course, there's a single-point cane and a front-wheeled walker. So there are a lot of choices to be made. And as a therapist, how do we make these choices? Well, the first and foremost question is, what makes you walk most normally? So what bracing, what assistive devices make you, make you walk most normally? Because when you walk more normally, I know that means you're expending less energy and you're going to be less fatigued. It's going to quiet some of your spasticity and you're going to decrease your risk for falls. 
So in search of balance. So to keep our balance, we not only have to have the muscle strength and control to stay upright and to catch ourselves if we falter, but our brain also has to make sense of all the sensory inputs coming at it so that you know where your head is, where your body is in space. So the three main sensory inputs we use to keep our balance is our vision. We use our vision so we use to have a reference point to know whether or not we're balanced. We feel the floor through our feet, so we use our somatic sensation. And also we use our inner ear. So our inner ear helps us hear, but then also there are mechanisms in there that help us know where our head is oriented in, in space. So Anne's going to discuss the visual component of this and how visual issues can influence your balance. Thanks a lot, Kathy. That was real informative. I just learned a lot of information from all your slides. Thank you. So in talking about vision, there are three conditions that can affect balance common with MS. I know through experience in working with visual problems that they can be extremely frustrating and debilitating for people. The first condition is called optic neuritis, or inflammation of the optic nerve. It is the most common for people with MS. People may experience temporary pain, vision loss, have blind spots, decreased color recognition, and contrast sensitivity. Another condition is called nystagmus, which is characterized by tiny rapid eye movements or rhythmic jerkiness that can make your environment look wiggly, bouncy, jumpy. Diplopia, or double vision, is another one. Diplopia creates dizziness and vertigo and sometimes nauseousness. All of these conditions affect visual acuity, peripheral vision, ability to track, visual perception, and all of that can influence falls. So what can you do? First and foremost, if you do experience any of the conditions I just described, please consult with your doctor if you haven't already done so. Corticosteroids and other medications are used with these conditions when they are in the more acute stage. When conditions are more chronic, rehabilitation principles help people adapt. Some suggestions are to add contrast to your environment, use good lighting, avoid fluorescent light, and instead use natural white light and also heat-controlled light. Night lights are also very valuable to have your path always lit. Mark doorways, stairs, and steps with a contrasting color of tape or paint. This will more automatically bring your attention to that step or to that change in threshold to help prevent tripping. And eliminate glare by wearing polarized sunglasses. Remove mirrors in places that a reflection can bring confusion and accurately perceiving your environment. And to help with pain, in addition to discussing with your doctor, I have found success in using mind-body approaches to minimize the stress pain can make, and it calms the whole body. Examples of what I mean are breathing techniques, meditations, rest. Rest also aids in the prevention of overheating, which it also can increase visual symptoms. To help with double vision, you can patch an eye. Or if the double vision is persistent, explore a placement of a prism that can go within eyeglasses or on top of an eyeglass to help merge uh, into one image, single images. A neural ophthalmologist is the specialist who does this. Now, Kathy's going to talk about sensory. So it's important, it's helpful to be able to feel the floor underneath you to get a reference point to know whether or not you're balanced. Sometimes I'll have clients tell me that they find it more um, easy to balance when they're walking around barefoot. But, of course, that's not always practical. Um, so when it comes to shoe choices, you want to avoid shoes with a soft, cushy surface because then you're always on um, a, 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 almost like a, a foam surface that's going to confuse you as far as where your, your feet are in space. Um, and avoid shoes that don't stay secure on your feet. If they're sloppy on your feet, again, um, you're, you're distracting yourself with that. And you want shoes that are one with your feet and not very squishy so you can feel the floor through your feet to get a reference point. 
And assistive device can be helpful because it gives you one more point of contact with the floor, so one more reference point with the floor. And also, again, it's, a, it's that support. If you do start to falter, you have something to correct your balance with. So addressing vestibular or inner ear issues. So like I said, there are three sensory inputs, your vision, your somatic sensation, and your inner ear to keep your balance. And if you're having trouble with the inner ear component, sometimes we can just teach you to use your vision and your um, somatic sensation inputs even more to make up for it. If you do have inner ear issues, we can also give you exercises targeted at that, which may help improve your connection to that, to that function. But in general, when you're having balance issues, what's really important is to slow down. It helps you focus your attention to plan your, your, um, what you're going to do to reduce your risk of falls, but also very important, it allows your brain more time to process what you're seeing and what you're feeling um, to keep your balance better. So Anne's going to now talk about cognition and its influence on balance. Yeah, so it's a good segue when you talk about slowing down and increasing your attention. Cognition does have a lot of influence or can have a lot of influence on balance. Cognitive changes can occur at any time, and the severity of problems do not necessarily correlate with the length of time of the diagnosis. Cognitive changes can involve problems with concentration, with memory, specifically short-term memory, organization, problem solving, speed of processing information, and visual perception. Cognitive changes can require more energy to keep up with daily life. So when we are less attentive and distractive, falls can occur. We may forget our new cane at home, or we forget our new exercises and walking recommendations that PT has just given to us, and thus falls can occur. We may process information slower, and our bodies may move faster than our minds, and falls have a potential to occur. We visually see our environments differently and become disoriented, losing our sense of direction, making it more easy to get lost in public places. These are just some examples of how cognition can get in the way of your balance in provoking falls. So what can be done about this? If you feel you get distracted easily, try to perform one thing at a time. Don't multitask and eliminate as much as possible for, in terms of environmental distractions. Examples could be noises, clutter, or crowds. Now, obviously, you can't control public spaces like you can your own home, but going out in less busy times where there are less crowds and giving yourself extra time so you don't feel rushed will help. Kathy will be talking about that a little bit more uh, further down in this uh, webinar. If you feel you're forgetful or have difficulty organizing, be willing to ask for assistance, delegate tasks to others, and simplify how you perform tasks or simply your expectations. If you feel you get lost or disoriented easily, set yourself up for success and have someone go with you when you go out and about in the community. Medications can also influence balance. There are a number of medications to manage both the MS disease process and their MS-related symptoms. All medications have side effects. People react to their meds uniquely, and it is important to know all of your medications, including supplements if you take them, and your dosages. And keep a list excuse me, with you wherever you go. Talk to your doctor or your pharmacist to know how these medications could affect your mobility and your safety. So heat intolerance, how does heat affect everything? Um, with MS, we know the issue is that your nerves are not conducting effectively. They're slow. With heat, when nerves are heated up, they conduct even slower. So some of the ways to manage heat intolerance is clothing choices, wearing clothes that breathe, material that breathes, wearing layers so you can peel off layers as you get warmed up, um, using cooling devices, which I'll discuss in a minute, 
keeping well hydrated, which I know if you have bladder issues, that could be a challenge, um, but keeping well hydrated and hydrated with cold water. And also the time of day. So we know early in the morning and depending on where you live, sometimes later in the evening, things have cooled down in the summertime and it's not as hot out. But also our core body temperature is cooler first thing in the morning. So that's another reason why some people are able to do more in the morning. So some ways to stay cool. Some high-tech ways are cooling vests. And the Multiple um, Foundation of America, I believe that's what it's called, has assist, uh, financial assistance um, to obtain these cooling vests if that's what you need. But some low-tech options are using spray bottles, um, using air conditioning, air conditioners, obviously, uh, personal fans, drinking cold water, wearing a wet cap. Well, what this woman is showing, um, demonstrating in the picture is actually a tie. You can get these at REI and some other outdoor stores, and it's filled with, I don't know what type of gel material, but you wet it, and it keeps you cool. It can be very effective. So cooling off our neck and our wrists tend to be most effective in cooling off our core. And if you're choosing to do pool exercises, the ideal temperature of the pool is 80 to 84 degrees. So that's kind of the temperature of an outdoor pool, one of those pools where you have to get in and then you're comfortable. That's the ideal pool temperature. So now Anne is going to talk about bladder challenges. Oh, yeah, the bladder. I think we all can relate to the urgency at one time or another, and there is nothing worse to feel rushed and stressed in trying to make it to the bathroom in time, especially in public places. So if this is an ongoing problem for you, keep these suggestions in mind. When you are in public places, know where the restrooms are located. Try to get yourself on a schedule to avoid sudden urgency and rushing. Talk to your doctor. It is important to look at your diet and be aware of foods and drinks that may irritate the bladder. Are there any behaviors you experience that make your symptoms worse? And what I mean by that are anxiety, stress, and fear. Do these increase your stress? Does this correlate with the increasing urgency to go to the bathroom? Be aware of this and see what can be done. You may not know this, but physical therapists work with people in ways to decrease urgency, urge, and frequency. They show you how to find the right muscles and to use them correctly. All right, Kathy. So fear of falling. Fear of falling can get people into this vicious cycle. When people do fall, it, they tend to set themselves up for fear of more falls. And then what very often people may find themselves doing, consciously or unconsciously, is avoiding situations where they may risk falling. So when that happens, they become less active, and when you become less active, you get deconditioned, you get out of shape, and actually put yourself in a position of having an increased risk of falls. Plus, of course, if you're less active, you tend to get more socially isolated, um, and that, again, just creates this, um, this cycle that we'd like to break through through physical therapy um, and these other advice that we're giving you to decrease your fear of falling and risk of falls. So he is going to talk about the other extreme now, overconfidence. Thanks, Kathy. It's interesting. The New York Times today, in their section called the Science Times, had an article specifically on what you just said about the fear of falling, and it correlated exactly with your words. So it is a fear that we all have, especially as we age or we go through changes in life. It is it is something we all do deal with. But back to overconfidence. Okay, so confidence is a feeling of self-assurance of your own capabilities. This demonstrates an awareness of your strengths and limits, and it is a good thing. Beware of overconfidence, though, meaning false confidence in your own abilities. Are you realistic with yourself and others? Also, don't assume falls are a part of living with MS. So I'm now going to segue into discussing how to make your home more safe. And at the end of these slides, Kathy will be discussing how to make your community more safe. 
The first area I want to look at is begin by talking about entryways. And I'm going to use a little arrow here. Let's hope I can get it okay. So one thing that we um, – I'm pausing. I apologize. I'm trying to get my arrow. If you see on the right-hand side, there are pictures of a doorway. There's a green door with a black mat. That is an example of a contrast. Below it is a picture of a stair, an inside stairway, again, with different colors contrasting the change in the threshold. So these are just some examples of changing of color contrasting. But I mentioned this earlier when I talked about the vision. When you change colors, it helps with our visual processing to better anticipate change, and it helps to prevent tripping. Handrails or railings are, of course, important too, and there should be railings along any staircase. Ramps, as you can see on the left, are pretty self-explanatory if they're needed. There's all kinds. They're easier to install nowadays. And although this picture doesn't necessarily show it, um, they can be a little bit more aesthetically looking now too. And continuing to talk, okay. Hold on, I got my arrow, so I'm stalling my, sl my slide here. In continuing to talk about stairways, uh, I, this is just another picture, if you can see the difference here of the colors, and it just makes it easier. It's visually easier to look up the stairs, whereas when you look at this picture on the left, I mean, that just brings fear to anyone. No security. The next slide I want to talk about, or the next area, is talking about the bathroom. So if I was going to ask a polling question tonight, I'd be curious to know where people fall the most. And I bet many of you would respond the bathroom. In my experience in working with people, this is the area that causes the most trouble. Many adaptations can be done in the bathroom. And just for some examples, you know, these are grab bars. I'm sure you're all aware of them. Some are mounted within the wall, while others are suctioned on the wall, which requires no drilling, as others are mounted or clamped on the side of the tub. All these are good type of grab bars that can increase your safety. The use of a bench to sit on to bathe, and this one allows someone to prevent someone to have to step into a tub so you can slide over into the tub. You can also get benches to be within the shower and within the tub. Those, again, sitting down takes away that huge component of focusing on your balance, of your strength, of all of that. So you can just focus on bathing. So good thing to sit down, save your energy as well. And again, here's a commode or a raised toilet seat with grab bars on the side to help with the ease of um, getting on and off the toilet. And if we now go into the ba uh, bedroom, excuse me, uh, here are some more rails. This is another area that most people I work with uh, say they fall, and they fall getting out of bed. So that can have some uh, easy adaptions as well. Uh, bed rail, such as the one where my arrow is, it sticks between the mattresses, so it doesn't require any drilling. There's a larger component one, same technique, raising up the bed, or not only a bed, chairs as well. See these little, little stoppers on the bottom there? That can just increase, sorry, the arrow is not helping with some of you that are having some vision challenges. That just a little bit of raise can help getting up and down so much easier. And then the pictures to the left are pictures of lighting. And it's a little redundant, but I'm reinforcing a theme here. The better the lighting, the more help you get with walking and preventing falls. Decreasing clutter, the more open spaceways you have to walk, the more you'll have decreased chance of tripping and falling. So just some really good ideas to remember. Now let's talk about kitchens. Use adaptive equipment such as this. This is a reacher. Uh, instead of, use these to grab items that are out of reach instead of trying to stand on a stool and risk your balance. Better yet, though, a rearranged kitchen or place item that you use most often within arm's reach. But to perform tasks, 
to take away the demands for body strength, endurance, and balance so you can more easily prepare or cook food more efficiently. There are many, um, excuse me, there are many more ideas, and we're just touching upon this because we have a wealth of information in this webinar. But if you do have more questions, these are some resources that can help you get your uh, questions answered. The National MS Society, as you know, is an incredible resource. And I recommend this article, At Home with MS, Adapting Your Environment. It goes into more thorough, thorough details about adapting your home. The other thing on the website you see below, it's called ABLE Data. And this is a website. And what I like about this website is that it provides objective information about the specific technology, products, and rehab equipment. They don't sell equipment, but they provide information on over 40,000 items and their costs and where to obtain. Okay. Now, Kathy will talk to you about some changes that can be done in the community. So some of the challenges in the community are the crowds, and we'll discuss the challenges of that, crosswalks, sidewalks, shopping, and all the challenges that brings. So in general in the community, sidewalks. Some of the challenges sidewalks have are they can have cracks in them, and that puts you at risk of tripping on the cracks. Um, the pitch of the sidewalk, in other words, the angle of the sidewalk, can throw your balance off as well. The edges, you have to make sure you stay on the sidewalk, and especially if you're walking with a walker and you're not tipping part of the walker off the sidewalk into the grass. And then, of course, if there's debris, if it's um, a garbage day and there's things on the sidewalk that you have to work your way around, bad weather, and sometimes leaves will fall, if they get wet, they're slippery. So all sorts of challenges that way on the sidewalk. An intersection. You can see the top intersection versus the bottom intersection and the challenges in that top intersection. There's a lot of things to process when you approach an intersection. You have to figure out where is the flow of traffic, um, where are the traffic uh, lights, what is the timing of the crosswalk lights, is there an island you can stop on as you make your way across the street, um, what is the distance for that crosswalk, because certainly it's, it's further in some intersections than others. And the other big challenge is what is the pitch of the curb cut? Because sometimes curb cuts will pitch downwards, and then sometimes the street itself will pitch upwards again. Um, and then you have the yellow bumps that are for people who are, are visually impaired, blind. Um, they can actually throw you off if you have a mobility issue going on. Um, and what is the quality of payment? So are there cracks in the curb cut and such that make it difficult? And then, of course, if there are crowds around you, um, that peer pressure of getting going in a timely manner, that can distract you as well. So in the community, for example, when you're shopping or you're going to a concert, there are a lot of distractions. Um, it can make it difficult to focus on the task at hand and where you're walking and the type of uh, terrain that you're walking over and such. There can be unpredictable movements. If you're walking in a crowd, you never know how fast someone is going to walk in front of you, when someone's going to suddenly change directions, and you have to react to that. So one suggestion could be keeping your distance. But just like when you're driving, if you can keep your distance from people walking around you, then you're not going to be as prone to be thrown off by their sudden movements. Um, and then also when you're in a crowd, trying to figure out the flow of traffic. So again, there's a lot to think about. You have to figure out the flow of traffic and where are you trying to he head towards. Shopping. Shopping, again, you have to deal with crowds and, and those people moving around you and making sudden movements. A lot of distraction, including trying to remember what you're there for and where it is in the store. Some, a lot of obstacles you may have to work around and figuring out where the most direct pathway and the clearest pathway is to get to where you want to go in the store. So addressing community issues in general. The biggest suggestion is allow for extra time. So again, you want to allow your brain as much time as possible to really process what you're seeing around you and your environment, figuring out a plan, 
of how you're going to get through whatever terrain, whatever store, wherever you are, in a safe manner. Um, arrive at a scheduled event early if you can so that you can find the best seat, you can find the layout of the land, you know, where's the bathroom, where is the exit, where are you going to be able to see the best. And you're not rushing in terms of trying to get someplace and run the risk of falling. Also consider the time of the day if you have a choice of when you can go out. Do you want to go out early in the morning where things are cooler, where you have more energy? And if you're going to a store, consider the time of day when the store is going to be quietest or when you know the flow of traffic of getting there um, by sidewalk or whatever when things are going to be quiet. It can really be helpful to be a creature of habit. So, for example, if you always go out your front door and head towards Trader Joe's, if you find a path where the sidewalks are pretty good, the crosswalks aren't that wide to go over, the crosswalk, um, the, the timing of the crosswalk is such that you can get over there without feeling rushed, be a creature of habit and go the same way every time. Um, if you go to the same store all the time, then you know the layout of the store. One thing I always do my, myself, which makes my shopping so much quicker, is when I write my shopping list, I write it according to the layout of the store. So I can just do one swoop around and get everything done. So I like to be a creature of habit. If I go to a different Trader Joe's, I'm totally thrown off by a different layout at the store. Um, consider using more supportive assistive devices. So what I always discuss with my clients with MS is get a closet of equipment. You know, because of the way your symptoms wax and wane, get bracing on your feet, on the AFOs if they're appropriate. Get a walker if that's appropriate. But maybe you don't need to use it all the time. Maybe around the house you're walk okay walking without those things. But when you're going out in the community, what is your goal? Your goal is to go out and have fun. Your goal is to go out and have shopping, and do some shopping and get that accomplished. That's your goal. Um, so use whatever it takes to make that easiest and put you at less risk of falls. So when you get up in the morning, you want to think, okay, well, what am I doing today? What do I need to wear? What equipment do I need to bring with me? So when you go out in the community, you may want to con consider using more orthotics and assistive devices than you might need at the, in the home. Um, organize your outing. Organize your outing according to rest breaks so that you're not over-fatiguing yourself and you can get accomplished everything you need to get accomplished. And be sure you're well-rested, well-fed, and hydrated. None of us work well if we're tired, if we're hungry, if we're thirsty. So that's really important. So, before you fall, so that you don't have a crisis when you do fall, learn what the best method is to get up. So, this is where a physical therapist can help you. Learn what the easiest and safest, best technique for you to do fall recovery. Learn if you need any sort of assistance or prop for support to get up. And it's important to practice fall recovery before it happens because when you do fall, there's a lot of adrenaline going on and you're just not going to be thinking as clearly. So you really want the whole act of fall recovery to be as second nature and automatic as possible. So if appropriate, make it part of your exercise program. When you do fall, what's really important is to rest. Because remember, you've already blown your schedule if you fall. Um, so take your time. Rest and take as much time as you need. Take inventory to make sure you didn't injure yourself. Because if you did, it's important just to get help and get the assistance you need because you could cause injuries to be even worse if you try to get up and just ignore them. Um, and man maintain control of the situation. So if you're out in public, if you're at home with your family, maintain control of the situation and direct others as to the best way to help you. Now, Anne will have some more tips and advice for you. Good advice, Kathy. Thanks. Tips to say to have an emergency plan. In addition to preparing what you would do before you fall, prepare an emergency plan before you need to use it. Most of us do this, but only partially. Carry a cell phone, have numbers programmed into the phone, and carry your phone with you wherever you go, in addition to when you're in your house. 
Have important phone numbers accessible in more than one spot around your home with a plan attached. So if others come to help you, they are clear with what to do. And a plan. This is where we don't all follow through on. Who is your first responder? Do you have neighbors you can count on? What is your hospital of choice? Have someone close to you help you formulate a plan to the extent that you need it. Because just remember, having a plan also helps your family and friends and your loved ones. And having a plan, remember, it means possibly getting immediate attention if a fall were to occur. And this can lessen the potential impact and time needed for recovery. There are a lot of different medical alert systems around, especially if you live alone. They've advanced so much um, with the mobile phones and having apps. So that is something also to think more about if you are alone, um, just to have that extra protection factor for you. Okay. So to summarize, different things to consider to stay vertical. First and foremost, what Anna was talking about earlier is self-awareness. Um, with MS symptoms, they wax and wane. It's really imperative to develop a self-awareness of how do I feel today? How are my MS symptoms today? And to be honest with yourself as to what is realistic to accomplish. Um, exercise, keeping your body in the best condition possible so that you have you know, appropriate strength and coordination and balance and such to reduce your risk of falls. Like we just discussed, have a plan. What do you, what's going to happen if you do fall? And learn from your mistakes. It's not realistic to expect that we're getting rid of all possible falls. But when you do fall, instead of developing a fear of falling or a, a sense of negativity, oh, I'm not doing that again, Learn from your mistakes. Is there a way that you could have done something differently so that next time you avoid a risk of falls so and you can still enjoy that activity? Address home and community hazards. We went through some of the more common hazards and how you can address those. And develop a, a balance between fear and overconfidence. Um, so you have a healthy sense of balance, but not one that limits you from going out and enjoying things. Dan? Okay, thanks. Okay, remember, everyone, your goal is to stay vertical. If you are self-aware, know your strengths, get assistance, or make adaptations in areas that are more difficult for you and have a plan, you are empowered. You can stay better calm and confident. Understand what your risk factors are and learn more from the MS Society. So other resources from the National MS Society is a free from falls program. Um, they have a four-hour version of this program and an eight-week version of this program that goes into everything much more extensively than we had time for today. They also have a guidebook based on that free from falls program called Minimizing Your Risk of Falls, a Guide for People with MS. Thank you very much, and I yeah, thank we're you. going on to questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy and Anne, for all of those tips. There's quite a bit of information um, that surrounds, you know, staying vertical and, and um, avoiding falls, and, and we've gotten quite a few questions. So um, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. Um, one of the questions um, that we received, um, and we actually received a lot of these through our registration process, was in regards to um, different um, assistive devices. And this person asks, um, can you talk about how a person can know when to choose a wheelchair um, and or a scooter for safety's sake, and you know, when should we choose to use one versus the other? So one question I often ask clients when they come in is, are you making choices to not do an activity because you know it's just going to be too much? It's going to be too far to walk, take too much energy. And that's where looking into a wheelchair or a scooter would be the best idea. Um, so certainly when it comes to wheelchairs, the choices are manual versus something with power. And um, with the manual wheelchair, you just have to remember that it takes energy to move as well. I hope that answered your question. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so our next question we had was about footwear. I know, Kathy, that um, you had talked a little bit um, about footwear, but this person asks if um, you have any more tips in finding the right type of footwear, and she's going shoe shopping this weekend, so she's looking for some good tips. Um, well, if you put on a pair of shoes and you think, wow, this is like walking on a cloud, that would be the wrong footwear. Um, so you want something that has a good arch support um, because that can keep your specificity quiet as well. But, um, again, like I said, something that's firm so you can feel the floor through your feet. Also, you want to look at the heel of the shoe because sometimes if you look at the heel of the shoe, it's more narrow than the bulk of the shoe. And that means that you're balancing on a smaller surface. So, for example, some sneakers you'll see, um, if you look at the back of them, the heel kind of flares out from the shoe, and that gives you a wider surface to balance on. Um, and uh, I know that you guys have talked a little bit about, you know, um, having a plan when you fall and kind of what to do and what to be prepared for when you fall. But we also received um, a lot of questions asking if there's any safe way to fall. So if, if someone has started um, to fall, is there a way that they can try to catch themselves or fall more safely? Well, I, I guess the, the idea is the drop and roll. Um, if you if you try to catch yourself, then you sometimes are putting yourself at risk for um, for injuring like your arm or your wrist when you're trying to break your fall. So the more relaxed you can stay with the fall, the better. It's always a hard answer to it's always a hard question to answer. It's not like I'm going to yeah. push you to the ground and practice over and over again. <laughs> so staying as relaxed mm -hmm. as possible. <laughs> And this also brings back the element of what Kathy said. The, the key words are staying relaxed, uh, being you know, calm, taking that deep breath if it happens, and hopefully that you have someone nearby, or if not, you have that cell phone or that medical alert button or something that you can access immediately to get help as you need to. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, Let's see here. Um, this person asks, is there a better time to exercise uh, in the morning, afternoon, or evening? So you want to yeah. so you want to look at a, your first of all, when you wake up in the morning, how do you feel? Do you have the energy to exercise at all that day? And what else are you hoping to accomplish in that day? So you want to make sure you're not. Um, distracting yourself from everything else you have to accomplish because you only have so much energy in the course of the day. So I find that sometimes it's an individual um, thing. You know, usually you have more energy and your core body temperature is cooler in the morning, so that can be more practical. Sometimes it's more practical at night because you're going to bed anyway afterwards. What are some of your, your thoughts, Anne? No, I agree with you completely. It is very individual, and it goes back to looking at that fatigue management. So if you're not sure, if the person who asked this question is unsure, it's taking a look at a, kind of a typical day and do it three to five days and jot down when you feel your best. Is it, like Kathy said, late morning or early afternoon, or are you more aware of a time period that is not good for you, like late afternoon or mid-afternoon? And see if there's a pattern in your energy. So work around that. Again, whatever your priority is, and this exercise is your priority for certain days, slot it in when you have most energy to perform. You'll receive the most benefits from it as well. Thank you both. Um, so just a few more questions here. Um, we've had quite a few questions about, you know, different resources and, and also, you know, items that can be purchased to help with mobility. And um, this person asks if there is a specific site um, or a website um, where, you know, articles or these uh, items needed to help with mobility can be purchased. Do you guys know of any resource like that? Well, I think, first of all, I would really recommend you go to a physical therapist to get an objective mm -hmm. professional point of view. Um, also, most physical therapy departments will have items for you to try 
to see what is most appropriate, what feels right before you go and purchase it. Yeah, I just add to it, uh, reinforce the same thing. If you're looking at uh, any type of adaptive equipment and you're not quite sure, again, having a consultation as an outpatient or even sometimes you can get it with insurance to go into your home for occupational therapy and or physical therapy to make the wisest decisions of what you need. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy and Ann. And I think that's about all the time that we have for um, questions right now. And I apologize to those um, whose questions we weren't able to address. Um, but there is another way that you can address these questions. Um, you can go to our website, um, and we have several resources here. And we have our Ask the Can Do team um, portal on our website that you can find at mscando.org. It's our Q&A. Uh, web page, and you can go there and submit questions that you might have, or if you have a question here that you weren't able to answer, and we can address them for you very quickly and, and forward them to either Kathy or Ann or to any one of our other um, uh, programs consultants. Um, and just some other resources that Can Do MS has. We also have our e news, which is um, our um, monthly newsletter that we send out to um, everyone that's. Um, that's been a participant of one of our programs, and you can learn about all of our uh, all of our upcoming programs and events. Um, and we also have our Can Do Library, which is full of all kinds of library articles that are written by our programs consultants on different topics in health and wellness and MS. Um, so please remember to visit those resources for any questions that you might have. Uh, before I share our next month's topic, um, I'd like to introduce you to I Conquer MS. I Conquer MS is a new way to fight MS, and it empowers people living with MS to answer a survey and securely contribute their health data and ideas for research. This information that you would provide will um, give insights into enabling new and more effective treatments to be, to be developed. So if you're interested in participating, just visit uh, www.iconquerms.com. Dot org, register as a member, and you can contribute your information and your ID. And also, I just want to remind everyone that March is um, MS Awareness Month, um, and so you might find some things in your local community about things that are um, about MS awareness. And our next webinar is going to be on April 14th. It's at the same time at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic is on updating your outlook on progressive MS, and that will be uh, uh, presented by Pat Kennedy, our, our nurse practitioner, and Roz Kalb, who's our psychologist. So please uh, join us live from the convenience of your home or office at no charge to you. So again, thank you so much, Kathy and Anne, for all of your um, advice and all of your tips and tools and knowledge that you guys have on staying vertical and, and staying upright and safe. Um, and thank you, everyone, for participating this evening, and I hope you have a great night.